Okay, so uh, can you all hear me? Yeah, okay, so yeah, thanks for the introduction. So I'm Clive, I'm from CQT um, uh, down at Singapore, and I'll just take this time to thank the organizers for um, giving me this opportunity to just talk a little bit about what I've been working on. And I think also a reason to, an opportunity to come down to Canada this is like my first time here. So it's actually been really special and enjoyable for me. So, as, but as you can see, this talk is not really about um, how much I'm enjoying Canada. It's about, it's about this Bayesian retroduction framework that uh, me and my PhD supervisor, Valerio Scarani, and a collaborator from the University of Nagoya, Francesco Buscemi, has been kind of working on. Yeah. So um, the, the way that I'll kind of approach this talk is to really give, so there's always this temptation for me to talk about like really obscure theorems and proofs that I'm like working on that probably would benefit not many of us, if any of us. Um, so what I'll try to do is talk really, really about global concepts, um, key points about this framework that is really qu quite embryonic, uh, to be honest, and uh, that hopefully would illuminate some conceptual points, no matter where we are kind of coming from, uh, especially since we're at the end of a conference. And I think many of us, our brains have been going through quite a lot of thermodynamic dissipation. So OK, um, so this. If, if I were to kind of say like what this talk is really about, it's really about the concept of reversibility. And um, I think no matter where we're kind of coming from, um, a primarily physicists or primarily computational uh, scientists, um, reversibility does come up um, at least every now and then, if not quite often. And um, I think the kind of go-to places where people kind of explain the concept of reversibility might be something like the reversibility we see in classical laws as compared to sort, the sort of irreversibility that we see with like second law and thermodynamics and so on and so forth. The kind of things that Boltzmann was really racking up his brain uh, about. Um, meanwhile, for the information theory side of stuff, um, recovering a message that's been going through a lossy channel, things like error correction and cryptography, these are um, times that reversibility does rear its head. Another particular um, object that reversibility is quite, in, um, that rever reversibility is quite important in would be these objects called fluctuation theorems. And uh, the kind of famous ones are Crookes fluctuation theorem and Jarjizi's equality. A quantum version of, of, of Crookes would be this fluctuation uh, theorem, sometimes called Tasaki Crookes. And um, the kind of main headline news, if you want to put it, is that these can be seen as generalizations of the second law, that when um, the forward process and the reverse process are on like kind of quote unquote equal footing, uh, probabilistically, uh, that's where you have the second law saturated, that the, the work being done is the same as the decrease in the free energy change. Yep. And the sort of significance of these uh, fluctuation theorems is that they don't need to, they don't need to satisfy like very strong thermodynamic assumptions, like um, that everything needs to be quasi-static and um, like uh, kind of far from, uh, these things can occur far from equilibrium and so on and so forth. And, uh, the significance, of course, is that even though these are kind of quote unquote fuzzy scenarios, um, we can still say something quite definitive. Um, we have equalities down here. So um, these fluctuate, uh, fluctuation theorems are satisfied by all sorts of scenarios, um, something like a levitating nanosphere. Um, these are RNA molecules kind of folding and misfolding, um, and even rotor proteins uh, in a wet environment. These things uh, satisfy. Uh, Crookes and Jarzinski. So these are really important. Um, uh, uh, and the, the, the point that's being made here is really that we can see how reversibility is important in many uh, different fields in physics. But what is reversibility anyway? What can we say to understand reversibility as a concept? And I think most of us can arrive at this uh, kind of um, way of speaking of reversibility, which is that reversibility is the comparison between a thought process and a associated reverse process, right? Um, where the, the work that I'm kind of uh, banking off from is really tries to answer is how do, we un how do we understand this association? And there is where we kind of answer that we should understand this reverse process as a kind of Bayesian retrodiction on the uh, forward process that we basically apply Bayes rule on the forward process in order to understand what this reverse process is. And this is basically the subject of the paper that um, my, my, uh, my supervisor wrote with our collaborator. And then the, the second paper, uh, the kind of follow-up paper that I'm involved in, 
But really, our works are inspired by a 1965 paper by Satoshi Watanabe on the conditional probability in physics. And so, having said all these things about what, what uh, using these terms like Bayesian retrodiction and st stuff like that, let me kind of just unpack this a little bit. So, the kind of Wikipedia version of Bayes rule that we're more familiar with is written like this. But Watanabe made a, I think, a quite an important point, which is that, look, if we have the pro conditional probability of A given B, that's actually not enough for me to get B given A. I actually need to invoke this completely, potentially completely um, arbitrary uh, prior, often called the reference prior, PB, in order to then uh, get PB given A. Of course, then some, some of us might be asking, how about QA? Well, QA can be derived from the other two objects in this equation. Um, and so this reference prior needs to be defined or else we do not have this opposite conditional probability. So that's the main point here. And in the notation that we have in our papers, it's written like this. It's basically just to emphasize that phi here, this channel, is mapping initial states i to final states f. And the retrodiction channel, once again, um, can be done with, a, with, with these, subspaces, uh, with these uh, state spaces. And we still need, uh, uh, once again, a reference prior. Yes, yes. Uh, you note that as i over here. OK, so let me give you guys a bit of a toy example. Uh, uh, almost an all too familiar example. Okay. Uh, funny thing is that I did this talk in Trento in Italy uh, once, and I actually had to live this uh, particular example. So uh, you get what I mean later. So, okay, so this by self test is really a kind of physical mechanism, right? We, have a, we take a kind of glob of ourselves and we kind of put it into the self test and we hope for the best. Let's say the best doesn't occur and we get a positive result. And then, of course, then the next question we ask is Am I sick? And notice that we can't really answer this using just this channel. Notice that because the channel here for the physical mechanism is conditioned on the fact that your glob gives you this indicator that you are sick. The, the, the sickness is the conditional for this channel, not the consequent. So what you're actually doing is you're actually doing retrodiction. When you, look, when you ask the question, am I sick? You need to invoke or you need to apply a reference prior in order to decide or quote unquote decide whether you're sick. And of course, if I think that I'm like the second coming of Christ or something, that I'm never going to be sick, then I'm never going to believe that I'm sick, right? Um, of course, that doesn't mean that you're not sick, but that's how you're going to update your belief. That's really what Bayes' rule is telling us. And of course, if, let's say I want to be really, really unbiased about this, and I want to kind of apply the I don't know anything prior, which is just a uniform prior, then I just need the probability of a true positive to be greater than that of a false positive and I'll be convinced more than not. Okay, with that kind of tall example out of the way, let me just uh, talk about the more formal um, uh, stuff. So I think this one is quite um, easy to, to understand that a for, uh, for physical process phi or for channel phi maps uh, probability distributions of the initial states pi down to um, output uh, distributions qf. Now, the retrodiction of this phi would then be given just basically by applying Bayes rule that we just fill up the kind of entries with uh, uh, this, this particular expression that is given by Bayes rule. And then we slot back in the output that we have into the retrodiction channel and we get a retrodicted input. Okay, so immediately some conceptual points should be made. Some of us might be asking like, okay, but why do we label these two things differently? Aren't we doing retrodiction? Shouldn't this be the same? And um, to be fair, if your actual input state and your reference uh, prior over here is the same, then you do get ex exactly the same two uh, objects down here. They will be the same. But of course, once you've done that, then actually you knew what your actual state was, right? It becomes tautological. Okay? Um, you don't actually have to do retrodiction because you already knew it. That was your reference. And in general, when you do not actually know what your initial state was and you invoke a reference prior here, it could be the uniform prior, it could be a steady state, it could be anything, honestly. But once you invoke this, in general, these two objects aren't the same. And this is not, shouldn't be too spooky to us. It's just the acknowledgement that, um, that retrodiction is not the same as naive inversion. P A given B is not the same as P B given A, right? Um, I, when I start my toe, I'm definitely in pain. But if I'm in pain, that doesn't mean that I start my toe. I could be in pain for different reasons. I could be in pain because I'm a PhD student or something. So 
this basically acknowledges um, that our best guesses about, um, past, about the past typically approximates the actual initial state rather than full on just recovers this. I'll, I'll kind of return to this point a little bit later. Okay, so one last point to say about the output here is that likewise, this actually should be separated as well. Some of us might be really confused at this point. Well, it's really for full generality um, that um, the, out, the outputs that can be put into the retrodicted channel should also include states for which are quote unquote not possible for the forward process. For instance, our virus self-tests in general are stochastic, right? So technically, no matter what we put into the state, you're gonna get a mixture, okay? But yet, we should be able to retrodict even when we have a full-on probability one positive result. Okay, so that's just the point here. And for more technical treatments of this, you can look up um, probability kinematics or soft evidence or hard evidence and Jeffrey's conditioning. Okay, so everything has been classical or stochastic channels uh, so far. What if it's quantum? And I think um, we may get what you might already expect that we have a channel, a quantum channel, and we basically map the input uh, alphabet or the input um, state space to preparations and the final state space to uh, a, a complete POVM set, for instance. For the retrodiction, there is where something more interesting occurs. And that's where we invoke this thing called the PETS recovery map. Okay, and a lot of things can be said about this PETS recovery map thing, but I'll just say a few. First is that, note how the PETS recovery map can be seen as a kind of quantum uh, base rule. And this is really well explored um, in um, uh, Leifer and Specken's uh, archive paper on this subject. It's very, uh, I think the treatment there is the best. Um, but most importantly, notice how there needs to be a reference state to characterize this PETS map. If you don't have this reference state, you don't have a PETS map to speak of, okay? Just as um, we need a reference prior for a base rule. Okay. So with all this fanfare about reference priors and reference states and stuff like that, a natural question that we immediately ask is, okay, but are there channels for which the retrodiction channel is always the same no matter what reference prior you use? And there are, okay? Um, and these are quite familiar to us. These are bijectively deterministic channels, basically unitary channels for quantum and permutation channels for um, say a classical stochastic process. But note that this is a if and only if relation. And this also happens to be the case that um, this is the only case where retrodiction is naive inversion, okay? And this is proven in the paper that I'm involved in. Uh, for both quantum and classical, there's a parallel for this situation, okay? And this formalism that I just kind of uh, put forward is what can recover both classical and quantum fluctuation relations in this very information theoretic way uh, without um, a, a lot of thermodynamic kind of or classical um, conceptual stuff inside the, the mix that it's able to recover these things. For that, see uh, my supervisor's first paper on this subject. Okay, so one last point before I, I finish up. So a noteworthy extension is that for retrodiction and, di uh, retrodiction and dilation. So I think most of us know that an AND gate, for instance, is uh, not reversible, uh, right? But it can be actualized by a reversible process. We just have to make sure that um, we kind of extend the state space that we're speaking of, we add another bit, and then after that, we kind of make sure that the bit is just one of, one of the states, say like the zero state. And after that, we trace stuff out and then we get the end gate. So we get an a irreversible kind of um, standard a computational uh, process or channel from a reversible channel on a larger state space with a given kind of buff or an environment or just a bit, right? And this is of course a textbook example of a much larger thing, which is something that I think we all know is that every channel can always be seen as a marginal of a um, of a uh, kind of larger process on a bigger subspace. And then we trace things out and we get that channel, right? So once we make that point, right, there's immediately another question we ask, which is that notice that there are two ways to retrodict a forward process. We can first marginalize the process. We have the big process um, and after that we marginalize to the small space. And then after that we retrodict, we apply base rule on that smaller um, process in a sense, the target process. Or we could apply base rule from the get-go on the entire thing, and then after that we marginalize, right? And then the next question is, how do these things compare, right? And it can be proven that these things are, are always gonna be the same as long as we are consistently 
in making inferences our bath with regard to the reference state that we uh, reference prior that we use. And so this is very nice because no matter what, if me and you have um, a target process, the same kind of target process, but it's coming from a different kind of dilation, no matter what our reverse process are going to be the same. We don't need to know the details about the big room stuff. Okay. This doesn't work when it's quantum. Okay. The, the kind of quantum channels uh, dilations that we are more familiar with, um, whereby there's a unitary acting on a target system with an ancilla. When we try to do this thing about whether the order of marginalizing and retrodicting versus retrodicting and marginalizing, this no longer holds that they are, they're going to be the same. In general, they are not the same. And the reason why is that um, for classical scenarios, we are able to kind of um, consistently, uh, kind of almost um, slot back in consistently to our reference prior, the correlations of the future bath. We can do the same for the quantum side, but we can't do that for the quantum co correlations. The entanglement will be lost when we, trace, when we trace things out after we marginalize. And so that, that's really the difference between uh, the quantum and uh, classical um, dilations and retrodictions in that sense. Okay, and, and these observations uh, contribute to modeling or understanding reversibility in non-Markovian processes when we have a memory bath kind of carrying uh, some kind of information around. We can, so it's, it's much easier with the classical process if we can model it properly. But once it's quantum, it gets uh, really, really complicated with all these quantum correlations. Yeah. So if you want to um, kind of dive in uh, deeper onto these matters, you can check out hidden Markov models and quantum collisional models as well. So this is my summary. So yeah, one can see the connection between a forward and reverse process in terms of Bayesian retrodiction, uh, and these help recover fluctuation relations. And this is in the first paper my uh, supervisor did. And um, for both quantum and classical channels, retrodiction depends on, the re uh, on a reference prior. You need to invoke it. Um, and retrodiction is not the same as naive inversion. This is always the case unless we have a kind of one-to-one -one and one-from-one -one, uh, situation, whether it's quantum or classical. And lastly, is there must really the case that what distinguishes classical and um, quantum uh, retrodiction is really this, the role of decoherence and quantum correlation. Okay, and so, uh, as you can tell, this is quite an embryonic kind of, we're still starting out this formalism and seeing where it can go. Um, and so we really look forward to your insight and collaboration if this is something that you're interested in. And yeah, thank you.